Jonathan here, and today we're going to go over a brief history of the FreeBSD operating system from the origins to the modern day, the notable benefits of each major version of FreeBSD, and where FreeBSD is used. But before I begin, I'd like to provide attribution. All of the images presented in this video were retrieved either from the Wikimedia Commons or directly from the FreeBSD Foundation. Both are nonprofit entities that gladly accept donations. Now, many people question what FreeBSD is, as they have never heard of it. Since many people are familiar with Linux, it would be apropos for a brief comparison. The Linux ecosystem is very similar to that of FreeBSD in terms of operation. However, FreeBSD itself maintains the complete operating system, and this includes the kernel, the drivers, the user land utilities, and documentation. Whereas Linux, on the other hand, only maintains the kernel and drivers with sole reliance on third parties for system software. Another contrast to Linux is the licensing, and this also helps uh, partially explain the origins of FreeBSD. FreeBSD has a permissive license, while Linux has a copyleft license. A permissive license and a copyleft license both allow individuals to copy, modify, and redistribute uh, work so long as attribution is provided. Now, the primary difference is that FreeBSD's permissive license allows developers to include their own copyright statements in addition to the standard BSD license, while Linux's copyleft license requires the same license on all derivative works without any form of additional licensing. With that said, the origins of FreeBSD began nearly two decades before its release. In 1974, Bob Fabry acquired the source code for Unix for research Unix from AT&T with the assistance of DARPA, which had the intent of advancing the operating system. The modifications are canonically packaged under the names of Berkeley Unix or the Berkeley Software Distribution, or BSD for short. The modifications made during this time include the incorporation of the TCP IP stack, virtual memory, and the Berkeley Fast File System. Two years after Fabry acquired Unix in 1976, the BSD project was founded. At the time, BSD contained license code belonging to AT&T. As a result, those who ran BSD were required to attain license from AT&T just to run the operating system. In June of 89, the first public release of BSD debuted called, uh, being called Networking Release 1, commonly referred to as Net 1. After this release, there was an internal discussion of replacing AT&T code, which was proprietary, with new code that was not. This project took 18 months and resulted in Networking Release 2, formerly known as 4.3 BSD Net 2, being released in 1991. Now, in an attempt to avoid the choking copyright under AT&T's license while using the Intel 8386 processor, also known as the i386, uh, a team began working uh, to make an operating system that would be able to use a permissive license for all core system files. This team's work created 386 BSD, which removed most licensing restrictions. The merging of 386 BSD in conjunction with 4.3 BSD Net 2 brought about the, the first version of FreeBSD in November of 1993. Now, the background itself uh, explains the origins of BSD up to the first release. But at the time of first release in November of 93, FreeBSD was quickly met with some tribulation. In 1992, AT&T had filed suit against 386 BSD's parent company, Berkeley Software Design Incorporated. Now, if interested, you could click the link over here on this side, uh, and you would actually be able to look up the uh, information in relation to the lawsuit between the Unix System Laboratories Incorporated versus the Berkeley Software Design Incorporated. In short, this suit and countersuit were settled out of court by Novell, who had purchased Unix System Laboratories Incorporated. Now, the key takeaway of the settlement was that 4.4 BSD Lite would be released with no proprietary files. This resulted in a 1994 release of 4.4 BSD Lite, and then a year later, in 1995, 
a release of 4.4 BSD Lite, uh, which FreeBSD2 was eventually merged. Now, from here, we're going to be taking a look at the major versions of FreeBSD and the most notable benefits. Um, as a brief overview of FreeBSD1 released in 93 and FreeBSD2 released in 94, ideas came about that introduced the world to the ports collection, which is a set of patches and make files which are computationally beneficial when considering the binary distribution models at the time. This ports collection was optimized for available resources and to this day still includes make files and patches. Imported in BSD2 was a full Linux emulation called ELF, e which is short for the executable and linkable format. Now this allows individuals to run Linux-based binaries uh, on the free BSD operating system. Very, very important to note. Now, just over four years went by and FreeBSD 3 was released. This version contained notable upgrades, including RAID 5 configurability with symmetric multiprocessing. And the appeal of those two advancements increased the computational speed and data per performance and reliability, which is always sought for in a server. Now, next, we go ahead and move to version 4 of FreeBSD, which was released in 2000. With this version of the OS, hyperthreading was introduced. KQ was added by a member of the FreeBSD core team, and this was an advancement in the input-output pipelines between the kernel and user land, similar to ePoll for Linux. KQ solved the issue of handling 10,000 concurrent connections on an active network. Also introduced was the gel system call and administrator commands. Gel itself is an OS level virtualization that allowed administrators to partition the FreeBSD system into several smaller systems sharing the same kernel while utilizing a small overhead. Version five of FreeBSD introduced, introduced uh, a new storage mechanism known as Geom. And this storage mechanism enabled RAID zero three and spanning. This also introduced encryption, compression, virtualization, and file, si file system enhancements, such as the ability to encrypt files and the ability to use authentication algorithms on files. Important to this version from, uh, important to this version, excuse me, was the mandatory access control and the common address redundancy protocol, also known as CARP. CARP enabled failover redundancies for when a host would go down, but would allow the service to seamlessly continue operating if it was running on another host. Now, this would be highly useful if running a server that had an SLA for system availability. FreeBSD 6 was introduced with a revision of the Wi-Fi stack complete with network bridging and additional, and additional Ethernet drivers. As a side note, those in the system hacking scene may remember that FreeBSD also introduced support for the Xbox architecture with FreeBSD 6. And this showed some uh, potential modularity and portability for FreeBSD at the time. Now, in 2008, uh, FreeBSD 7 was introduced. Uh, this brought forth a, a dynamic tracing framework known as D-Trace and also that allowed for troubleshooting both kernel and application problems in real time, and it was created by Sun Microsystems. Now, common in most Unix-like systems, FreeBSD implemented TMPFS for the purposes of mounting a file system in volatile memory, opposed to having it written on a persistent storage device. Now, I would like to take a note that D-Trace offered developers the ability to find the source of application and kernel issues in production machines, improving both, both host and application reliability. Now, just a few months later in 2009, FreeBSD was released supporting a type one hypervisor called Zen. With a clear focus towards business, FreeBSD supported and released Haste, known, also known as the High Availability Storage, which functions as a network-based RAID 1 mirror. 
haste implementation increased the reliability of FreeBSD as an operating system and as a data hosting platform. FreeBSD 9's release in 2012 was noted with uh, Capsicum's introduction of sandboxing, which on a server and a process, uh, which on a server, a process entering Capsicum would lose all permissions normally associated with the user, except for the capabilities provided in the form of descriptors. These descriptors not only controlled the local file system as they could send and receive Unix or IPC sockets. Lastly, the standardized open interface for virtual machines known as Vitro was implemented. Now, moving on to FreeBSD 10, which was released in 2014 with a type two hypervisor called Bybee hypervisor, uh, support for the Raspberry Pi was developed and SMP support for ARM version six was developed. 64 bit Linux binaries were finally supported through the optional compatibility layer for non Linux based for the non Linux based OS. Now, the a number of these are of note. Uh, this is useful as the Pi could be used in a production environment, such as on the floor of a factory to monitor um, metrics uh, and be running FreeBSD. Uh, FreeBSD OS, uh, the 64-bit uh, AMD-based applications that were native to Linux could now also be run on FreeBSD. This made the uh, conversion from Linux to FreeBSD a lot more appealing to a number of individuals because they would not have to rewrite the entire program. Now, moving on to 2016, FreeBSD 11, which whose support just ended last month on September 30th of 2021, provided support for the 64-bit ARM architecture. Trim was also introduced for flash-based storage devices to reduce the wear leveling and introduced was also an updated version of NetMap framework, which allowed faster packet processing on network interface cards. Although more focus would be considered for flash-based media in the consumer market, it does hold promise for the potential future use of flash-based storage on the enterprise level. NetMap, on the other hand, was clearly focused on the enterprise patrons as NetMap enabled servers to communicate at 40 gigabits over Ethernet. Now, we are truly moving into the modern era of FreeBSD, which is presently supported. With uh, FreeBSD 12 in 2018, uh, GPU modifications were made for processing on AMD 64 and i386 processors and allowed graphics drivers for modern Intel and ATI AMD graphics cards and were available in the ports collection. This is highly useful in a data-driven world where large amounts of local computation is now performed on GPUs opposed to the CPU. Now, just this year, as of April 2021, uh, FreeBSD 13 was released and included a, re uh, a rewritten network stack based on nextops. The kernel now supported in-kernel framing and encryption using TLS, and the in-kernel cryptographic framework was heavily modified to better support modern cryptographic algorithms and to simplify the network interface or simplify the interface for network for device drivers. As a side note, now you might want to click this link over here or go to it rather. Uh, as a side note, there have been a fair number of buffer overruns, licensing violations, and bad code in the latest version, according to Ars Technica. But users are hopeful that this will be resolved in the next update that users are currently anticipating is spring of 2022. Now, who uses FreeBSD? According to FreeBSD or the referenced companies, FreeBSD is used in a myriad of existing products. In short, many companies presently use FreeBSD in their backend systems. As a few examples, Citrix Systems Netscaler application delivery software is based on FreeBSD. Dell uses FreeBSD in the enterprise storage system. Junos uses free, is using FreeBSD, or has been using FreeBSD since 2.2.6 uh, in their Junos routers. Sony has used FreeBSD in the PlayStation 3, 
PlayStation 4, and PlayStation Vitra. And also the Weather Channel even uses FreeBSD to run Intellistar to determine local weather forecasts. Now, uh, there have been uh, a number of derivatives built upon portions of FreeBSD systems, such as OpenSense being a fork of PFSense, which was the successor to MonoWall. Uh, Darwin, uh, the basis for Apple's OS X for Macintosh, is based on FreeBSD, and the NAS for free is an open source NAS distribution that is also based on FreeBSD. In short, there are a number of derivatives from BSD that are both used in consumer and production environments. With that said, are there any questions? Okay, we have a question here. Okay. Now the question, it, it states that I mentioned that, excuse me, question that I mentioned that I stated that FreeBSD is able to run Linux binaries. And the question is, is that always true? Well, Yes and no. The compatibility layer is an emulation. The running of Linux binaries relies on system calls. As a high level overview, uh, the system calls made in Linux are implemented in the FreeBSD kernel. As a result, uh, executable images and shared libraries for Linux are nearly the same as in FreeBSD. This is with a slight caveat. If Linux introduces new system calls to the kernel, that FreeBSD may not properly handle, the system calls would require an update to the FreeBSD kernel. So as a result, if it is a brand new system call that is being used in an application, yes, it probably will not work. However, it will be updated in due course. Uh, with that said, is there another question? Yes. Uh, what is the most common reason businesses uh, choose to run FreeBSD? Well, that is a bit of a loaded question. The reason is more focused on economics than the technological. A business would logically seek out the greatest return on investment. The investment would have to consider the OS that is being supported for the project. This requires an analysis of the costs, including labor. As there are more Linux administrators than FreeBSD administrators, the acquisition of system administrators and engineers would obviously be in favor of Linux. With that said, a business's consideration uh, is also for the optimization of the OS for the work that will be done. It is of note that FreeBSD and the FreeBSD's nephew OpenBSD are arguably the most secure operating systems. As a result, the business would need to take that into account. In summation and in review, uh, if the business is focused on security, it may be the operating system of choice, dependent on uh, where it would be deployed, coupled with the availability of labor and the development of a service that would be hosted. And this is all based uh, with the real world system stability, system stability uh, based on the network load that it would be experiencing. All right, uh, next question, please. All right, uh, if a business was to run FreeBSD, where should it be implemented and why? Well, as I just mentioned, the security of the OS would be a point of note. Uh, within the realm of security, you may have data servers that contain confidential information such as HIPAA information or personally identifiable information that needs to be secure. Alternately, you may need a, a security appliance whose OS is based on battleground tested experience. Uh, with that said, a business may need to offer embedded applications that would run FreeBSD even. In this instance, you would want to go for nano BSD to create operating system images for something such as a USB key, networking devices, or even a smart coffee meter. This would be in an embedded framework that you would actually be using. So it depends on the actual reason for the operating system and how it would be implemented. All right, and thank you very much for your time and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Bye bye.